Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India discussion on numerical solution of one dimensional convection diffusion equation. So, last time we started our discussion on linear interpolation uh, and uh, we will continue the discussion on that. Now, so we recall that we uh, looked at the scheme for different uh, boundary nodes as well as uh, internal nodes. So, we continue to look at the uh, formulation for that. So, if you recall, uh, the internal node had a representation like this. And uh, these coefficients are actually linked with the A w and A e. So, we recall that the d w plus f w by 2 was A w and this was equal to A e. And when you go over to the right hand side, you find that it is equal to uh, A w phi w plus A e phi e. And notice that there are no source terms here. That means, we have all the terms represented in the form of the phi's corresponding to each node and the coefficient associated with the respective phi. So, there is no additional term here. So, there is no source term as we say. However, if we go back to say the left boundary node which we call as say node 1. So, the node next to the next uh, left boundary for that node if you look at the equation it will appear as So, what I am doing over here essentially is I am not distinguishing between say d e and d w and I am assuming that gamma is constant. So, in that case all the d terms will be reduced to uh, it will not have any suffixes associated with it right. So, that makes the uh, you know formulation simpler. So, this would help us in doing a simpler formulation. So, that is why we are making that simplification. So, that is the A p for the node 1 and then when you go to the right hand side, the coefficient associated with phi w will be 0 because you do not have a node on the west side because the boundary comes up before that. This is the coefficient for phi e, so we call it A e and then we are left with a term which looks like this. So, this is essentially a source term. We will call this source term as S u alright. And now, let us try to put these equations in a certain format. So, what is the format? Let us try to write the boundary node equations in a format like this. say like this and in this equation the A p would be A w plus A e plus A p minus F w. So, if you recall this was the standard form of the A p for the internal nodes, but then you will find that this would not be sufficient. You would actually have to accommodate another source term here in order to balance. So, we will find out what that source term looks like. So, look at this that the basic equation has one source term here. Again the coefficient A p has a source term here. So, that is the distinction of boundary nodes from internal nodes. So, let us try to put the expression for A p 
and try to work out what this SP is. So, AP is F by 2 plus 3 D and that is equal to AW which is 0 plus AE which is minus F by 2 plus D minus SP. So, if you transpose the terms, you can figure out that uh, the SP will turn out to be minus of F plus 2 D. Again, we already have identified SU. So, if you look at the total source contribution for this boundary node, then it is actually coming from a contribution from the boundary value itself which gets into SU because SU comes up in terms of phi A and then another part which is dependent on phi P. So, there is one part which is not dependent on phi P, but dependent on the boundary value, another part which is dependent on phi P. So, that makes the entire source term. So, if you similarly do it for node 5, which is on the right boundary, you will find that uh, one can show that, uh, okay, let us write down the expression. So, the equation looks like this for the right boundary. As you may recall that on the right hand side, we have a coefficient 2 D because the diffusion term works out as gamma by delta x by 2 because of the half grid spacing. That is why you have a coefficient 2 here and always remember that the right hand side the diffusion term is always being discretized using central differencing. Even after we finish discussing this linear interpolation of central differencing scheme and go over to other schemes, even there we will continue with the central differencing for diffusion term. Right. Now, here uh, if you rearrange these terms, you will find that A p will come out to be minus f by 2 plus 2 d plus d that makes it 3 d. A w here will not be 0 because you have nodes on the west side, but A e will be equal to 0 because you do not have nodes on that side and you can show that S u will come out to be phi b into minus f plus 2 d. So, that is how the boundary value comes into S u. So, once you are done with that, you can look at S p and uh, as you can remember from the node 1 calculations, uh, we first write down A p which is minus f by 2 plus 3 d and then on the right hand side we write down f w plus A e which is 0 and then minus S p. From there S p works out to be minus of 2 d minus f. So, we now have S u and S p and then again the source the total source contribution for the boundary node comes out to be this coming from S u and this coming from S p. Now, we are kind of ready to make a table of coefficients which will help us understand how the scheme is functioning, what are the specifics of the scheme. So, let us make a small table. So, we will call it say as a coefficient table and let us see how we prepare it. So, on top on the first row what we do is we write node and then we write down A w, A e, uh, S p, S u and then on the last column we write down A p which happens to be A w plus A e minus S p which we have already seen. Now, special conditions for node 1 and node 5 and we have same formulation for the internal nodes 2, 3, 4. So, if you go back to your equations, you will find these uh, expressions coming up. So, 
sorry we will rewrite it here once more. So, this is f by 2 you have d minus f by 2 here and here you have a 0 here minus of 2 d plus f 0 minus of 2 d minus f here 2 d plus f into phi a and you have a 2 d minus f into phi a here for S u and then A p which is essentially a summation of A w A e and minus S p comes out to be this for the different nodes. Now, we will try to figure out a small problem with numbers, uh, we will do two cases. So, let us call it say as case 1 and for this we are choosing some numbers. So, the density, the velocity, of course, we have them in dimensional form and uh, we will have to figure out based on these values, what is the f, f is rho u. So, that comes out to be 0 0.1 kg per meter square second and d comes out to be gamma by delta x which is 0 0.5 kg per meter square second and therefore, the important number, the Peclé number happens to be 0 0.1 by 0 0.5 which is 0 0.2. It is a small Peclé number that we are talking about over here. So, with this small Peclé number, how does the coefficient table look? Look at it. So, if you quickly redraw the table without putting all the calculation details, we will just try to put the numbers here, so that we can understand how the scheme is functioning. So, these are the coefficients on top, node numbers here on the first column and then if you do the calculations, you will get these numbers for the different coefficients. So, this is 0 0.45, 1 1.1, 0, minus 0.9. 1.1 here, 0 elsewhere and then A p of course, is essentially a collection of those coefficients A w, A e and minus S p. So, there are certain important things we need to look at. Uh, we find that these coefficients are all positive. We also find that the S p is negative. And uh, based on these values, we actually have to do certain checks, checks for the boundedness of the solution. For which we are going to invoke a criterion which is called as the Scarborough criterion, and that says that if you have all the nodes in your grid and their values put into a table like this, then do the calculation in this form and try to find out what this comes out to be for each node. Now, what does that mean? Each node would have a value of A p. Now, for boundary nodes, A p would also include effect of source term but internal nodes do not have sources, effect of sources. So, A p is the net coefficient for the corresponding grid point, while A and B are the coefficients of all the neighbors. And on top in the numerator, we are taking 
the modulus of the values. So, they could be positive or negative, but you just take the modulus of the values and then try to figure out what this ratio comes out to be. Now, by the Scarborough criterion, you should have the value of this coming to be less than equal to 1 for all nodes and for at least one node, it should be less than 1. So, if this is satisfied, then the boundedness criterion of the solution would also be satisfied. So, let us try to figure out whether for this particular problem statement, we have gone about satisfying the Scarborough criterion or not. So, if you do the calculation for node 1, for example, you will find that the numerator comes out to be 0.45, the denominator comes out to be 1.55, which is of course, less than 1. So, nodes 2, 3, 4, if you do the calculation, so you will find that on the numerator, you are left with 0.55 and 0.45, which are coming from the neighboring nodes. And what you have for the particular node is 1 in the denominator and that is equal to 1. And then for node 5, it comes out to be 0.55 by 1.55, which is also less than 1. And clearly, we have satisfied Scarborough's boundedness criterion. Another criterion, which is important for boundedness to be satisfied, is that SP remains negative. In fact, this would ensure that we end up satisfying Scarborough's criterion. Additionally, we have to keep in mind that is there a possibility that Scarborough's criterion may be violated. Now, Scarborough's criterion would also mean that if you are doing the calculations with all the coefficients remaining positive, then that would ensure boundedness. So, if the coefficients become negative under certain circumstances, will that create a problem for the linear uh, interpolation or CDS scheme? Is there a possibility? Yes, if you look at the table of coefficients, there is a possibility of this coefficient, which actually comes from A e to become negative under certain circumstances. What is, what is the circumstance? If you have a situation that this becomes less than 0, then you will have a negative coefficient. So, if that happens, what is the condition we get out of it? We get f by d greater than 2, which means for Peclet number greater than 2, the CDS scheme will not remain bounded. So, what would this lead to? We can speculate that this would lead to some numerical instabilities, right. We will see them later through some simulation results, but this is clearly going to create trouble for us. Let us do a quick problem where we actually get to see that. So, we earlier did a case uh, with a few numbers uh, chosen for the different uh, parameters. So, let this be the second case. And uh, what we do is we keep all the remaining values same, we just change the value of u, which is the velocity of the field to 0.625. What would this do to f? f would change to 1.25 kg per meter square second, d remains the same as before. What would do what would it do to the Peclet number? The Peclet number will become 2.5 and what we saw through the coefficient calculation, this is likely to create trouble. Now, does it come up from the table of coefficients itself? Let us try to see. Of course, it should. So, again nodes here. So, this is A w, A e, S p, S u and A p. So, we will just put the numbers together 
in this table and we find that A w will attain values uh, like this. We do not see a problem here with sign, they are all positive. However, we see negative signs coming up in A e and that is clearly going to create problems. S p takes up a value of minus 2.25 which is ok, but we come up with a positive value here which may create problems. Again S u will look like this and A p will look like this. Now, if you do the Scarborough criterion cri uh, check for node 1, it will turn out to be which is uh, less than 1, sorry, and then for nodes 2, 3, 4, it will be 1.25 by 1, which is clearly greater than 1, and this will create trouble node 5, it is 1.125 by 0.875, which is 1.29. Again, this will create trouble. So, this case is likely to create problems, which of course, we anticipated right in the beginning, because it was having a Peclet number beyond 2. So, this could be a good time for us to have a uh, look at some numerical results, uh, which will make things uh, still more clearer. But before we do that, we will uh, just try to write down the, the case 1 situation in matrix form, so that we just have a glimpse of how the system appears when we try to uh, translate it to a matrix form. And where the all the coefficients figure in the matrix. Of course, you can figure out that a banded structure is coming up, which is expected. So, let us call the values of the 5 different nodes as phi 1 to phi 5 and uh, what comes on to the right hand side, uh, you can clearly understand that the right hand side essentially is contributed uh, from S u. So, S u is the one which contributes to the right hand side. Okay. The rest of the terms here in the coefficient matrix of course, come from the coefficients we have already calculated and which figure in the table that we have used. So, of course, through a matrix inversion you can uh, solve for phi 1 to phi 5 to give you the distribution. Now, let us take a few minutes now to have a look at some numerical results. So, here is a result uh, where we have a domain of unit length, which is indicated along the x di direction and you have two boundary values of the domain. So, on the left of the domain, you have a phi value of 1, on the right of the domain, the phi value is 0. The phi values are indicated along the y direction and what you see over here is uh, all the values that we have discussed about, they figure over here, uh, that is the case 1 that we talked about. All right. So, this is the case 1 result when you have a low Peclet, uh, Peclet number 0.2. All right. So, <clears throat> as a reference, we have also indicated the pure diffusion plot over here. That means, if there was no uh, advection, no effect of advection, then the distribution of phi would have looked like that. <coughs> However, we have advection 
to a weaker extent. And uh, that would mean that the curve deviates off and how does it deviate off? It deviates upwards. Why is it that it deviates upwards? Only then we can go closer to phi equal to 1 as we approach the left boundary regions. Of course, at the left boundary precisely phi will always be equal to 1. But as advection becomes stronger, what happens is it has a stronger sweeping effect of the left boundary value towards the right. Now, since the advection is weak, it cannot sweep the value of phi equal to 1 further downstream in a very strong way. And therefore, you remain close to the pure diffusion case only with a slight deviation towards the upper side. So, this is the physics behind the curve going on to the upper side. All right. So, if that is the issue, we should see a stronger movement towards the upper side if we make the flow move with a larger velocity. And that is precisely what happens when you go to the Peclet number 2.5, because now the u has become stronger. So, uh, if you remember the u value over here is 0 0.625, while here it was 0 0.05 meters per second. So, what does it do? It sweeps the value of phi a much further downstream, much closer to the right boundary. So, what does it do? It, it advects phi from the left boundary far into the domain. And therefore, the phi a value is retained as far as nearly say this region. Right? So, that is primarily the difference between the, the left, cur the left uh, figure and the right figure on top. However, we have a big problem here. We have wiggles. We have a strong you know, oscillation in the solution on top and what you see at the bottom is the exact solution. Where was the exact solution in Peclet number 2? It was almost merging with this curve. So, what we understand is that in Peclet number 0.2, the central differencing scheme did a good job in capturing the physics, because we could not distinguish between the numerical result and the uh, analytical result. But here, up to uh, a good extent, it did follow the analytical curve, but towards the end, it deviated off because it started oscillating. So, if you say that up to a region like this, there was a close match because we were seeing the same curves. But then, the central differencing went up. So, you have a point out here, while the analytical result went down which is expected of, of course, because you have to match up with the phi b value on the right side of the domain. So, where was the problem? Problem was with numerical instability caused by a fairly large Peclet number in terms of the central differencing scheme, because central differencing cannot work beyond Peclet number 2. So, that was the difficulty. Now, let us see that is there any way by which we can solve this problem. So, there could be a remedy, but before we look at a remedy, we look at a situation which is even more adverse. If we push it to Peclet number 5, you see that the solution uh, oscillates further. So, there are more points which are oscillating off you know, from the analytical solution. So, you can expect more and more of those oscillations coming up if you push it to Peclet number larger and larger and beyond a certain point, of course, you will probably end up with not a number kind of situation in your numerical calculations. That means, uh, the computer will not give you any solution at all, it will crash. So, there is a way of course, to solve the problem. Can we bring down the Peclet number to below 2? Yes, one way of doing it is to refine the mesh, to put in lot more nodes, so that the Peclet number for the same velocity, in fact, over here the velocity is larger than the case 2, it is twice as that of case 2, which was here. So, here it was 0.625, but uh, in this case we are using 1.25, 1.25 al was also used here, but you can now see that there are no wiggles anymore. 
because the Peclet number has been brought down to 0 0.5 and now you have a smooth solution and not only that you have a fairly good match with uh, the analytical solution they almost merge with each other you cannot probably distinguish the two curves. So, of course, Peclet number 5 is uh, it was not a trivial case which we saw over here and uh, for the central differencing scheme we found a way to solve the problem by putting in lot many number of nodes. So, earlier we were using 5 nodes we multiplied it by 10 made it 50 nodes and then it sustain, sustained the strong advection. And now you can see that for Peclet number 5 how far the phi a value from the left end has made its way into the domain. That means, there is a strong advection of phi from the left to the right end of the domain. So, that is what makes it a strong advection case. So, we find that the CD2 scheme works well for advective flux with fine grid and when advection becomes strong CD2 would work as long as we can kept keep the Peclet number below 2 and that can be achieved by using a fine mesh. So, we will continue our discussion on other numerical schemes in the next lecture. Thank you.